we do want to present tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Jeff and the team here in a minute. Uh, we have we are continuing to go through the process of getting the final uh, guaranteed maximum price pricing and all the um, details of that sorted out. We got our first detailed look at that. Um, we will be back um, in two weeks with what those final numbers are. I can tell you that the um, the cost of construction for the building, uh, well, there will be some other soft costs on top of that, but the construct cost of construction, including our contingency for the construction will be in probably the 68 to $70 million for the building in total. That's both the community center portion and um, the uh, office portion that will go up depending on what other numbers we layer into that. Point of that and telling you as we go into the discussion on parking is we're fairly confident that we do have enough money to be able to explore some uh, parking solutions that would in, that Jeff's going to talk about. Jeff and uh, Katie um, and the rest of the team are going to talk about a little bit. So we're not prepared to discuss in excruciating detail, which we will be on, prepared to discuss that on the 20th, exactly what it is that we're buying and what the pricing is on that. But we do feel confident enough at this point to say, um, yes, exploring a parking garage um, or a parking deck, if you will, is financially feasible for us. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jeff and uh, Katie Freeland from um, MSA Sport to walk us through the presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, members of council. Um, we want to just begin by giving a little bit of background on how the parking ratios for the project were established. So what you see up on a screen is kind of a summary um, from the final development plan process that Continental Development worked through with BZAP um, to establish the parking ratios. Um, so the first bullet there um, kind of lists everything out, um, but they they worked together and kind of recommended a ratio um, for the apartments based on the number of bedrooms. Um, you can see a difference in the senior housing depending on whether it was for the assisted living or the independent living. Um, you'll notice both the restaurant and office spaces were set at four per thousand, which is the maximum parking ratio for the Kingsdale overlay. And then the community center um, was recommended at two and a half spaces per thousand square feet. Um, our staff at the city uh, went and developed a uh, peak parking demand study using the Urban Land Institute 2019 shared parking metrics. Um, this was a tool that they used to confirm um, that these ratios were accurate. And this study um, looks at the parking ebb and flows throughout the day, knowing that the community center is gonna have a different demand than office space, than apartments, than typical office. So this study was really meant to look at when different uses on the property really were experiencing their peak demand. Um, staff at that time determined that the um, recommended parking ratios were accurate based on the results of that study and that the site would be um, adequately parked for during peak demand. Um, one of the comments um, that staff made in their report to BZEP was that parking needs may be further reduced um, based on mode share. So they recognize the fact that the um, Kingsdale site has very good pedestrian access. Um, it's very accessible by bike um, as well as public transit. And they also recognize that many of these uses, including the uses at the community center, um, would have a high carpooling potential. Um, and then in March of 2001, uh, BZAP voted to approve the final development plan uh, which was based on these parking ratios. So we kind of give you all that as a little bit of background and then we're gonna let Katie kind of come up and to explain more of the process we went through on the community center and kind of where we are today. Thanks, Jeff. So when we started our work on the community center project, which is just one building in this development, um, the feasibility study had identified some parking that was, I think in their study, located at grade, so at ground level. So the parking that was associated directly with the community center um, was thought to be at grade. And once we started engaging with the community and with you all and really studying the programming elements of the building, uh, that ground level was, uh, there's a lot of people and amenities that wanted to be on that ground level. So as we developed our process, we thought, you know, it makes sense to put the pool on the ground level. We want a big open lobby, child play, some of the fitness. These amenities started just naturally migrating towards the first level of the building. And with that, through the SD process, we came back and proposed studying underground parking uh, for the parking at the community center. And that was well received. So we moved forward with that. 
Um, as we developed that plan for the underground parking, uh, keep in mind, and I'm sure you've all seen it, we do have a lot of site constraints that we're working within. Um, it was determined that the most efficient way to park under the building was actually to utilize a one-way traffic flow. And with that, we were proposing angled spaces. I'm sure if you all remember one of our early plans, you came down a ramp, you went around a loop, and then you exited, and we were using angled parking uh, with some parallel parking off of that. And then where we could, we did have some um, additional parking squeezed in that were compact spaces. So that was what we came um, out of that SD plan with for the parking. Uh, once we got into it was July of last year, we recognized and it was recognized that there was a need to really have focused discussion on the parking strategy that was being explored. So we had a series of small focus groups where we laid out the parking. We really talked about what it would be like to come down the ramp, to park in these spaces, um, just really walked through what that experience would be like. And the result of those focus groups and the feedback that we heard from the community was that that was not really practical and that there was a desire to explore other options for parking besides under the community center. So with that, when we moved forward, uh, we removed the underground parking, uh, but we did prioritize some spaces on site at grade. Uh, those are like located south of the community center. And I'll show you a, a exhibit here that indicates those in a minute. Um, keeping in mind that this is a development and the parking is dispersed throughout the development, the ADA and accessible parking spaces are treated the same way. So I'll again highlight where those are adjacent to the community center, but they are dispersed throughout the site um, as the parking is shared throughout the site as part of that development approach. Um, from those workshops, we also identified a desire to prioritize the more convenient parking, if you will, uh, for those who maybe need a little bit extra time or have limited mobility. So these spaces are not necessarily true ADA accessible spaces, but they are spaces that we have identified um, having close proximity to the community center, and they will be signed and um, prioritized for those with limited mobility. There will be signage on those if they need assistance, they can call into the front desk of the community center and get assistance. Um, throughout this process, of course, we were tracking these numbers, um, and we have projected that there will be limited availability of parking during those very peak demand hours throughout the shared development. So with that, I am going to share where the parking is as it stands today. So again, this is a map of the overall development because we need to consider it as a whole. Um, so the building that is up on the north, that is the senior housing that is pretty much uh, is it done, getting close to done. Um, and then the building that is going up now, which is the garage and the apartment building on the east side. And then our building is located on the southwest side. Uh, the majority of this parking spaces that are located within this development is on the first two floors of the apartment building. So the first two floors of that apartment building are garage spaces. Um, and there's about 560 spaces between the first and second floor. Uh, the next big chunk of parking for this development is the 150 shared spaces. Those are located on the Giant Eagle parking lot on the north side. So again, convenient to this development. And then throughout, we have additional on-street parallel spaces. There's some head-in spaces around the senior. And then of course, we have additional parallel and head-in spaces south of the community center. Um, on this, you'll see that we tried to indicate with the smaller blue squares where the marked ADA and accessible spaces are. So those are dispersed throughout the development, again, concentrated on the main point of entries, those three buildings, um, and on accessible routes to the entry points of those buildings. And then in the green squares that are layered in there, those are the spaces that have been identified and will be marked um, for those with limited mobility. So with all that, we have right now 757 spaces in the Kingsdale development. Um, again, as Jeff noted, there is thought of the shared usage um, given the mixed use of the project. With that, I'm gonna let Jeff take it back over. So with that, um... What are some of our next steps as we look at meeting that peak demand and making sure we're prepared for, for the, the various events um, that might happen at the community center? Um, we've kind of identified three key areas um, that we think are worth exploring and will help meet the parking needs on, of the area. Um, the first is the city-owned property at 1615 Fishinger Road. 
um, right at the Five Points intersection. Um, as it exists today, there are 23 existing parking spots already paved, um, and there's a potential for roughly another 27 parking spaces there. So we think we could fit about 50 parking spaces on that parcel. Um, the thought with this is, is it would be a great location for during the peak demand to have some overflow. If there's a big event, they could have a valet service and go there, um, potential for staff parking up there, and really concentrating on keeping as much um, convenient parking open near the community center as possible. Um, another option that we've begun to discuss um, with engineering and with our planning division is um, parking along Northwest Boulevard. Um, it, it's south of Zollinger, already has the on-street parking, and we think there could be potential to add some additional on-street parking um, nor further north on Northwest as, as well. But obviously one of the biggest impacts we can make um, as we came in the fall and, and discussed with council a little bit um, is the parking deck on the northern end of Giant Eagle Lot. Um, Katie and her team have already been looking at a conceptual designs for this, and we feel pretty confident that this could yield a positive about another 100 parking spaces for the Kingsdale development. So it would really meet um, and, and a little bit exceed that um, peak demand level where we'd feel very comfortable and confident that the uh, development would be set up for, for a variety of peak demands. So just um, to kind of orient, this is the property at 1615 Fishinger. Um, as you can see, it is paved today. Um, if the building was removed and parking was added, um, there would be room for about a total of 50 spaces. And again, just the location of the parking deck, the same 150 spots that Katie shared as she went over the overall parking approach, um, but adding a second level of parking to that to yield about a positive of 100 or more spaces um, with pretty convenient access to the community center. So with that, we'll turn it over. Any questions? Mr. Wack, it seems Jeter. Thank you, Council President King. Um, could you contextualize for me what peak demand is? Like, like is it the community center is full to max, the senior, like what, what are we defining as peak demand? Yeah, so it's really when, when all the uses um, are kind of um, clicking at the same time. So it's times when the offices would be open. We'd expect a lot of people in the offices. It's time when it'd be a high use at the community center. Um, you know, it, it'd be those kind of um, start of the day when there may be appointments going on and people are using the community center. Or it might be five o'clock. It's really those transition times. Um, you know, it is challenging to nail down the exact parking demand of the community center because it is such a mixed use. Um, so that's why we're really relying on the work um, that our planning staff did and that BZAP did in establishing the parking ratios. Okay. So it, it's not necessarily a time of a day, but a capacity. It, it, it I mean, or is it a mix long and short both? of it, it's, it's that kind of five o'clock. People are getting home. Not everybody's left the office. People are stopping in the community center before they go home. Um, that kind of that or an event based peak. So if there's an event at the community center, um, if there's something up in that multi-purpose room up on the top floor, that's going to bring an ex an unexpected exit, uh, unexpected, uh, a higher than normal demand, mm -hmm. um, that could create kind of a peaking problem for us. Thank you. And do we have an idea on number of humans in a peak demand? Like, I mean, I, I know that's a tough thing to imagine, but has any thought been given to what is that in terms of people? So the way that the parking ratio, ratios are calculated is based on square footage when it comes to this type of use. Okay. So we use the square footage of the building, which then indirectly translates to how many people, people right. could be in the building. Um, so when we take just the square footage of the building, that's what we apply to that ratio that's already been established. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kulowitz. Thank you, President King. Is there a, a accommodation that will be made for scooters and bicycles and golf carts, a special place where, where they can park? We do have bicycle parking. Let me pull that back up. So I am only indicating the bike parking that is adjacent to the community center on this exhibit. I'm sure there's additional bike parking out amongst uh, the rest of the development. I just didn't have that information. So adjacent to the community center, uh, right along Tremont, and then just south of the corner, it is highlighted in a brown, I guess, tone there. Uh, we do have 38 bike racks there. Those are, you know, could accommodate two bikes each. 
Mr. Lynch. When we were discussing the challenges of the underground parking last July, you know, I was very cost conscious thinking, oh, geez, you know, probably do without. And early on, uh, Councilwoman Adams said to me, what I'm worried about is when we look into the future, will we regret not building a parking structure? Is that something we regret? And I've come to the conclusion that it would be. So I think if we can financially afford it, then it's something we should pursue. And I also look at the fact of what well, we're talking about, the number of people who are going to be in this, you know, peak use. I think we can expect the kind of quality of the tenants at Kingsdale to improve. I think we're going to, we should expect that the restaurant there will attract a lot of attention because it's going to be the place. And so I think when you see that, you know, increased quality of the tenants, restaurant, you add it all together, I think it's going to be uh, something that's needed. I don't think we're going to look at it and say that was um, the mistake or we were overly cautious in building that. We have enough parking on site today. Um, I've said things to you all before. This is not a good enough kind of community. This is a community where we want to make sure that we're doing it um, to the standard we want to do it to. And this is a, an area where I think a little bit of an investment will make some sense. Uh, and I do also want to go back to, I think part of the reason we, concluded that the underground parking wasn't the right solution was because it was going to be so unuser friendly. Um, it was going to be convenient once you got your car parked. Um, but boy, getting your car parked was going to be um, a challenge. Uh, so we, we think this is um, the right solution to be pursuing. Um, the one other thing that I'll say is we, we do feel pretty strongly that putting tearing down the building um, at five points makes sense. The buildings become functionally obsolete. It needs a ton of work. It doesn't make sense. It would never make sense to resell with the anticipation that someone would reoccupy it at this point with the condition it's in. So regardless, tearing that building down, grading the site, putting in some asphalt, even if it's for five years or whatever, um, is the right thing to do in terms of our strategy for that property um, with the community center coming in. And that gives us the time to see how the neighborhood absorbs everything and then really figure out what the right use of that property is in the long term. Yeah, <clears throat> a couple of questions. One, um, in terms of the parking standards, was there a change in those? Because I feel like for a long period of time, if you look at you know malls and things of that nature, it seems like we've always been overparked, right? There's been an excessive amount of parking. And then as you see new developments, I think in the past you've heard us say, are we sure we need all of that? Um, but then you look at Lane Avenue, you know, local cantina and the garage behind there. If you go peak time there, that's packed. I mean, you can't find, you're starting to find these off-street parking kind of wherever you can. So I was just curious if the standards have, have the standards changed a bit, and or are the standards that we had uh, approved by BZAP um, less or more than the standards that would apply to any other building that was built in the city? Council Member Close, I'm happy to try there to go, field Chad. that. Yeah. To answer your question, yes, the the standards have changed over time. As a landlocked community coming out of our master plan and our three year visioning process, we recognize that open fields of empty surface parking were not something we were going to be able to accommodate. So our seven mixed use districts um, included parking ratios that were maximums. In most of suburbia, you have parking minimums where a Home Depot, for example, could put in as many parking spaces as they deem um, necessary, which may not be used um, most of the year. Um, so um, with one exception, that is Lane Avenue. We did adjust uh, Lane Avenue after some of the restaurants um, were extremely successful. So that that planned mixed use district is the only one of our seven that has a minimum ratio component for restaurants and other uses, as opposed to Kingsdale, which has a maximum ratio four per thousand. We made sure that the numbers were um, conservatively 
uh, going to work um, by using the urban land institute ratios for each individual use. And so we had this um, fail safe, if you will, of looking at the different ratios and the urban land institute shared parking um, metrics and matrix. And we made sure that no matter what scenario occurred, um, BZOP was comfortable with the number of parking spaces based on the proposed uses. We haven't seen any other issues with using those standards. In no, our we've been we've been very fortunate that these numbers have worked. I recall a previous uh, city manager when we opened Lane One um, was concerned about parking and and told me in those uncertain terms that if there was a problem. I would be out there directing traffic um, <laughs> at peak times and other inclement weather times. So we made sure we got those ratios right. And so far, we've had really good success, especially when you have a, a variety of uses with different peaks. Um, I think our ratios are, are solid. Great. Um, I mean, I'm in, I'm in favor of this. The, uh, Steve has heard me say it before, I mean, we only have one chance to make a good first impression. And I don't want the reputation of this community center being there's no parking. You know, I brought up the RPAC as an example. It's a fabulous recreation community that nobody really goes to because I feel like the parking is um, expensive and impossible. Um, but I would caution just in terms of that parking deck. I mean, this site, you know, it's, even though it's dense, it's, it's beautiful. We spent a lot of time on the aesthetics of both um, Continental's development there to the north and east of ours and the community center. It's a showpiece. I mean, it's, it's, it's a work of art. I guess where I'd be concerned is that parking deck not be an afterthought especially if you're coming from the east side of this development, that it's not something that looks like a parking deck. I mean, any new development you see, there's a reason they put the parking kind of under the development or underground. So in, in terms of what we're looking at, I mean, <clears throat> if we have the money, I, I want to do this right. I want to make sure it's screened. It has, you know, it's not just all concrete. I mean, the good example is down in Grandview Yard with the brick. Uh, or any new development, if you look down nationwide area, all those parking garages, kind of how they're screened. Maybe not like the um, the convention center authority. I'm not a huge fan of how that looks, but something a little bit more classic, um, just to make sure it fits with the entire development because it kind of does stick out in terms of its structure versus everything um, to the north of it. But, um, so just in terms of the design, you guys haven't disappointed us yet um, in terms of what you guys have brought to us, but I just want to make sure we don't lose focus of that because fortunately, if you're coming in from the south or the east, you're not going to see how big and beautiful our community center is. You're going to see that parking garage first and it's going to screen some of it. So I just want to make sure it's done in the same way and we're making sure we're investing those dollars, but I don't think we need, we can wait, even though it, it is something you can strap on later. I, I just don't want to get to the point where it's going to impact our operational numbers because people are not joining because they can't park. We got to make sure that we fully utilize this space, that we get as many members as we can in our community and that there's no reason for them to join, especially due to parking. So thank you guys. Mr. Kluwer. Thank you, President King. One other question is, I remember early on a couple of years ago, the advice we heard from other communities that had developed community centers was that they, they start out, but then they, they tend to grow because as people understand what it is, they, the membership uh, increases dramatically and there's more of a demand. So with that in mind, I wonder, it looks like the, the structure that we're talking about at Kingsdale would be a two-story structure. Is there a, a reason that it would be limited to two stories or if we're going to do two, can we not do four or some other number? A couple thoughts on that. One is remember we're we're looking at things from a square footage standpoint so we cannot grow the square footage in this building and the building can only and and we are doing the parking demand on assuming full usage of the square footage that we have um so the concern is a little bit less and frankly um i'm going to say this i think it's true that the parking use ratios for community center parking are lower than they are for office. So as the use of the community center grows, the parking demand will go down. So if we convert some of the, if 20 years down the road, um, leases expire, the city chooses to convert that space to community center space, that's going to be a less intensive parking use. So um, long story short, uh, we don't think kind of looking for that um, Goldilocks point of how much do you build 
uh, for the expense. We don't think that adding another deck, uh, adding another level to the deck is financially justifiable. Additionally to some of what council member close was saying, it adds a lot of weight to the structure, um, in terms of the architecture. So that would be the other concern if we added another deck. So between the cost and the aesthetics, um, we would be concerned about adding a second level. I don't know, Katie, if you would add anything to that. Um, just to say that when we, I think the sweet spot is the right way, the right phrase there. When we've looked at sort of what that peak demand, anticipated peak demand would be, um, the spaces that are accounted for now, and then the potential of what could be added, which is that second level, that seems like that would really kind of balance that all out. So, um, and then I would echo um, the concern about making sure that it fits in contextually um, with the architecture. Um, if this were to move forward, that is something we certainly would be studying in great detail. How about those tenants in the in the buildings that are going to be a little bit obstructed by this? Are, it, I, I suppose that's, I don't want to seem callous about it. It's sort of not our problem, but has that been considered? or We've discussed that with Echo. Um, Echo is the owner of the property. Um, the signage that we have said that we'll build the structure, we um, would be ready to approve signage on the parking garage for the building, for the M what MCL. That's um, the big one that I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah that, that's MCL, the only one maybe that enters from the east. Yeah, and um, First Watch and Jeffrey Thomas are the ones that would probably be blocked the worst. There's plenty of room on that. There will be plenty of room on this structure for signage for those businesses that will frankly be better than what they've got today. And then give us a give us a feel for timing. When would this come to council? When would this? When do we need? So we need to. Ideally, we would be um, coming to council early next, or sorry, late this year um, to approve the contract to construct, so they could start um, about this time next year, uh, which would work well with the staging for the rest of the community center, as well as. Um, uh, our partners at Echo and Giant Eagle are, are pretty clear that um, we are not to be messing around in the Giant Eagle parking lot um, anywhere near Thanksgiving or Christmas. Um, and so um, we want to be, we need to be respectful of that. And it just works out well for timing. Then you're not dealing with any cold weather conditions when you're doing concrete pours, all that sort of stuff. It works out really well. In terms of design, though, I mean, we, didn't we already approve the design, pay for the design? We've already, yes, you all approved a contract modification for um, MSA in September-ish um, for them to start working on the garage design. So that is all um, already approved. I would I would say that, I'm sorry if I You're fine, still no. had, um, just in terms of the alternate sites, I'm, I would caution of doing anything on Northwest so we need it. I mean, that seems like a easier add-on. I don't know if that quite fits kind of how that's that traffic flows there, but people smarter than me could tell that. And I gotta say, I don't love the idea of having a surface parking lot at five point, um, recognizing the necessity being in there somewhere, but um, you know, to the extent that's, I don't see that as being a hugely practical space when there's other lots probably around us in terms of peak hours, such as the high school, other maybe opportunities that are closer, I don't know. Um, if it's something we have to do, we're doing anyway, I mean, I guess that's fine. I would just, again, on the aesthetics, I don't want to stare at a surface parking lot when there's other adjacent communities who are trying to get rid of all surface parking lots right now. Um, so just be mindful of, of that as we look at that plan as well. Yeah, and and that's that's kind of a two birds with one stone thing. The building needs to come down. Yeah. Um, so taking the building down, doing some strong landscaping and putting in some staff and overflow parking probably makes sense um until you know and it doesn't make sense to just redevelop that parcel on its own and so we need to wait for the market to come come along with something else and to be honest with you we we i feel pretty strongly that um once this is built and open <clears throat> built and open we need to see how it gets absorbed into the community before we start thinking about redevelopment of the rest of that redevelopment of that corner um, I think we owe it to the community as a whole, and we in particular owe it to those neighbors. 
I wanted to ask about um, if we have a sense of demographics of the youth and the older residents in particular. So when we had talked about the underground garage, one of the nice parts was you were right there on site. They could just take an elevator and there's ADA spaces that are required than whatever the ADA at the senior center and that kind of what the thoughts are for, for their youth here. Yeah, so when we actually met with a couple of different groups at the senior center to review the parking specifically, and when we outlined how you would navigate the underground parking, there was concern um, that it might not be as approachable as they would like. Um, so one of the things that was shared with them among many options was this idea of building additional parking at the Giant Eagle shared lot, and that was much more well received. I think that it just seemed um, a little bit easier to navigate and park, as Steve noted. Um, in addition to that, we do have the prioritized limited mobility parking spaces that are closer to the entrances into uh, the community center. So there are nine spaces that are south of the community center that would have direct sidewalk access into that south member's entrance there on the south side. Um, and then there are, I believe it's 37 spaces, if I'm doing my math right, that are located on the first level of the garage. So again, it's just a, you know walking along the sidewalk on the front side, right into that front main entry there on the north side. In addition to that, um, we do have a rather generous drop-off lane that is right on the north side of the community center. Um, there's ample room there for multiple vehicles to pull up, drop someone off, even help them in if they need to call into the front desk to get additional assistance. And that is located right next to the, the main entry of the community center. And do we go with the minimum number of ADA spots or how does that, how do those numbers work? We did not. So that is calculated based on the uh, overall parking that is provided. That's a code uh, dictated number. Um, so we actually exceed that number um, by quite a few. And just the way that we also try to disperse the development, try to disperse it throughout the development. So, um, and then of those 22 accessible spaces, six of them are van accessible spaces as well. So there's like a little bit uh, oversized spaces with additional clearance with those. So we have provided, um, the development has provided an excess of what's required for the code minimum for that. Great, thank you. 